Um, she's coming back from a tennis tournament. Um, so I'm going to fill in until she gets here, and then I'll gladly hand over the gavel. But um, at this moment, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, let's just first off, any adjustments to the agenda? Yeah. We moved the section that has to do with the, uh, Jess Jessica and the special ed up to the, she's under the weather and is here and would like, like to send her home. Yeah, is she here? Yeah. So I think that's item C. I would like to move up to the 6C, 6C to move up to the top of the agenda if we can. That's okay with me? Yes. Yeah. And I also, uh, under 6D, would like to bring the board's attention to the way uh, the policy for second reading is written. Um, I would like that amended to read, review the following policy for second reading, period. So we're going to be looking again at IJOC as a second reading and bringing it back to policy. Okay. Mm -hmm. To approve that in all of They generally don't. No, so I think you're fine. Okay. All right. Well, then, that being said, let's move to the first thing on the agenda that we've just switched for um, item 6C, consideration to approve the following job description. May I have a motion? Okay. I move that we approve job description for the behavioral specialist, BCBA. Can I have a second? Kimberly? I think um, if Jessica were here, if, 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 do, yeah. do you want to speak at all, Jessica, and before we vote? <laughs> so this position we're looking to put in instead of contracting with service providers, so um, part of what this job description entails is looking at providing behavioral supports to special education students, but also looking at developing behavioral RTI systems for um, the entire school department. So we're hoping that we get um, a lot more out of this person than we're currently getting out of just our contracted consult. And I hope the job description explains it's not limited to just that, but that's basically um, the minimum of what we're looking for. There's a, what cost impact is, if there is one at all? Sure. Um, right now, uh, we contract with three different people for three different days, and we're looking at, um, with the addition of the third person and all of the assessments we've had to do, we're looking at right around $45,000 for contracted services. Um, and most of what um, this job is going to be paid through will be local entitlement. So there'll be minimum impact to the regular ed budget, um, or the I should say the school budget, um, and most of it's going to be absorbed by the special education federally funded local entitlement budget. Um, and we're hoping, again, that um, you know, as time goes on, we look to be able to absorb a lot more of this through our, our own budget. Um, but right now, we're basically just adding a little bit, uh, we're adding an extra, um, we're getting two more days for just a little bit more money. Um, and it's really not, most of it is still coming out of that local entitlement budget. Thank you. Of course, great news. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Okay, so next we're going to go straight to the um, second item, which is approval of school board minutes. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the school board minutes as listed out in this evening's agenda. A second. All those in favor? Be sure to ask for discussion. There won't be any, but you can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> any discussion? <laughs> no, okay. 
thank None. you for that. I need that. Um, okay, next on the agenda is we have comments by student representatives, and currently we have no student representatives at the table. Um, so unless they're going to show up later, we'll move on to the next item, which is comments from the public on the agenda items. If the audience, if anybody in the audience would like to address, now is the time to address the board. Um, I ask that we keep it to about three minutes each, and um, you can just line up behind each other if, if you want to address the board. Thank you. Oh, and, oh, and one other thing, your name and your address first. I'm Ruth Ann Haley, and I live at 49 Brentwood Road. And I'm here tonight because I have a question on the budget, which was discussed last night at the town council. And I wonder if you could clarify or expand upon um, the capital improvement plan has been um, shortened to a, a short, shorter period of time. And $450,000 has been deleted from the budget. Well, you increase everything else. And there's a plan for a $5 million bond to cobble together things and be presented at a later time that was discussed with the superintendent and the faculty, the uh, facilities department manager. Do you know anything about that? Could you expand? So if I may, I believe um, some of um, what you were discussing was also discussed at last night's town council meeting. At the just project. briefly. It was but just briefly. really. Um, and um, many of the um, revolving pieces around our CIP budget um, have a committee, the Buildings and Grounds Committee, that are reviewing those line items. One of the reasons why the CIP budget was reduced in this budget cycle was that we had removed items that were not necessarily originally planned in the CIP budget. For instance, the original 2017-2018 school budget in included a proposal for some expansion work at the high school. And due to the massive cuts that we had received in revenue from the state, we took some of those more discretionary expenditures out. Um, in regards to a bond, that's really the first we have heard that, and that would have been something that we had discussed. I think as we're considering approving this school budget with the deductions that have just been presented last night, and the increases, which will affect all of us, including a lot of, you know, all of us in town, not just parents who support everything, but to be good stewards. If there's another sort of plan out there in the wind that a $5 million bond is being built, I think that needs to be presented at the time of the budget. And if your capital improvement plan has gone away, you know, I, I don't think that's a good idea either, because there was a good improvement plan in place, a 10-year plan. Excuse me, Ruth Allen, thank you so much for your words. Normally, at the public comments, we don't, it's not a reciprocal um, your question and answer. We'll take your questions, and if you want to address um, your question specifically to Howard Coulter, you may email him directly. Um, but at this point, I can tell you that there are, there's, it's all speculative what you're hearing. It's all nothing, nothing concrete. It could also be answered in the context of the budget vote next week with the town council. Exactly. Yes. Okay. As long as everyone knows and has an understanding about what the details are. Thank you. The details are Thanks open. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Catherine Miller. I am um, a resident of Cape, and I live at 122 Old Ocean House. One of the reasons my husband and I chose to live on Old Ocean House in Cape is because of the schools. For years, Cape Elizabeth has been on the charts for the best school in the state of Maine. And in fact, they were in the top five many years reporting. In 2008, we proudly displayed on our website that we had done well, had been the top third of all schools as ranked by US News and World Report for the high schools. It is to my dismay to see, though, that our continued ranking is falling each year. In 2017, the most recent ranking, Cape schools didn't rank. In fact, this Maine School of Science and Mathematics ranked first for the state of Maine, 19 nationally. Falmouth ranked second, Wells third, Greeley fourth. 
We ranked, we didn't rank in fact, so we were below Scarborough, York, Casco Bay High School, Gorham, Booth Bay, Madawaska, Caribou, and Bonnie Eagle. I know Mr. Shedd has written a letter assuring parents why we shouldn't be concerned and why the test that was used, the Smarter Balance test, really wasn't a priority for the students and we shouldn't be concerned. I am concerned. This is the second report that we've gotten indicating our school is not performing well. The recent report in the Portland Press Herald reported that among the highest and lowest performing schools in the state of Maine, our, there was a great disparity between our English and our math scores. Specifically, Cape Elizabeth ranked for English. 71% of the students are performing at or above grade level. With respect to math, only 62%. These numbers are getting worse each year. Particularly with the US News World Ranking, not ranking matters. I know that the, the indication is that the Smarter Balance test is a measure of performance, but the test was designed to help the school district not assess the kids' individual performance, but to assess how the school is doing. And if we're not having our students take that test, the school can't administer, can't figure out what are the areas of weakness, where does instruction need to be directed. That data is really important. And I know that under law, we are allowed to have parents opt out and that kids don't have to take that test. And Mr. Shedd has assured us that the students weren't motivated. But I'm asking the school board why. Why aren't we motivating our students to take standardized tests seriously? Why aren't we educating our parents as to the importance of these tests? In comparing Cape Elizabeth students' performances to the other students in the other areas of the state, the other students are doing better. They also don't have to take the test. Their parents are allowed to opt them out. And in fact, the test is administered with the same conditions throughout the state. And we are not performing as well as those schools. I think that until standardized tests are eliminated in high school, grammar school, and middle school, we have to take them seriously. They're a benchmark for success. They help us indicate how we're going to do in high school and beyond. LSATs, GMATs, there are constantly going to be standardized tests that we need to seriously take in order to get to the next level in our jobs, in our education, in our colleges. I am aware that Maine students are allowed to opt out, but I'm asking the school to motivate the teachers, to motivate the children, because the data matters. At the end of the day, the US News World Report ranks our schools. Colleges and other communities use that to help us assess how is our school performing. It is, does matter. We will be judged in the community based on our standardized test scores. It directly impacts college admissions. It directly looks at how our school is challenging our students and what we can do to, to succeed. So instead of saying that the students were unmotivated or to blame the type of test administered in that year, I think what we need to do is establish methods for the teachers to change what they're doing, motivate the students. If we're not performing, what is our curriculum coordinator doing to get these scores up? What are we doing to get back on that top five list? Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Paul Seidman. Just a question about process. Is now the time for people to address the school board on all topics on the agenda tonight? Yep. Yeah. On the agenda? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jim Sparks. I live at 14 Woodcrest Road. And I am a member of the group um, that is proposing the safe haven resolution that you are considering tonight. I'd like to offer a little bit of background about its creation. And um, I want to go back to last November briefly. Wherever one ended up politically last November, I think it would be fair to say it was a very unsettled time in this country. And there was a widely documented spike in physical and verbal attacks on Muslims those presumed to be Muslims, immigrants, and on Jewish institutions. So it was both shocking and not shocking to me one day in November after a Cape football game when I saw a friend who was in tears and I asked her what had happened and she explained that a xenophobic remarks had just been directed at a Cape student. 
And then she told me of other incidents that I didn't know about misogyny and xenophobia in Cape. And I remember feeling in that day that as if something had been unleashed across the country, that there was a sort of permission in the air to state what before had been unspeakable, or at least confined to the shadows. I also felt that our community needed to come together in some way to emphatically declare that it was not okay that people of color, people who are Muslim, or people who immigrated here from another country somehow do not belong. I had no idea what, what kind of response um, should be made. And then on November 16th, Elizabeth Seyfries and Howard Coulter sent out a thoughtful email about some of these incidents. They also suggested something much more ambitious than disciplinary action alone. They wrote that this could be a moment when we might, quote, educate and broaden the thinking and exposure of all of our students to different people, religions, ideas, and cultures. The silver lining is that we've been given an opportunity to improve and enrich, and we are going to seize it. I soon learned that Howard and Susanna Mizalhabs had already been meeting with Muslim families in town subjected to harassment. And a group of us, parents, educators, and students began to gather to consider ways to address harassment, exclusion, and also to imagine how Cape Elizabeth could become a place that would be more welcoming and more inclusive. The Safe Haven Resolution is one starting point. It's inspired by the work of communities across the country who are opposed to discriminatory actions aimed at students and their families. I want to give particular credit to the Portland School District as their early and active efforts to support student safety and promote inclusivity significantly influenced our resolution. It is true that a resolution such as this could be characterized as just words. However, these words express commitments about the kind of town and school district we wish to live in. These words convey that we stand by those who are most vulnerable to being treated as the other due to their race, their nationality, their ethnicity, their religion, their gender, or their sexual orientation. I believe caring about these matters does not reflect a partisan position, but one that is embedded in our nation's long, ongoing, and unfinished project to see that all people are treated with dignity. Beyond responding to incidents, the resolution emphasizes ways to actively promote values of inclusivity and pluralism. It calls for these values to be reflected in the curriculum itself. This begins to transcend tolerance and instead reflects a real commitment to shape a school environment that values diversity. I also wish to underscore a section of the resolution that states, quote, we commit to creating an atmosphere of respectful listening and dialogue across social and political divides and reject actions that stifle even unpopular points of view. This is more than lip service. It is my hope that in the midst of a highly polarized country, Cape Elizabeth might facilitate ways to bring together people with widely differing opinions in relationships that honor each other's humanity. Finally, this resolution sends a message that we stand with our neighbors if they feel threatened. It sends a message that students of all ethnicities, nationalities, races, religions, and sexual orientations are an important part of our school community. It sends a message that we are not neutral when it comes to the rights of all of our students and their families to be treated with dignity and to live without fear. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lillian Frame, and I live at Fort Dermot Drive. I'm a sophomore at Cape Elizabeth High School and a member of the High School Respect Team, which was created earlier this year. I'm here speaking in support of the resolution. I love our school. I feel incredibly lucky to have Mr. Shedd and Mr. Carpenter as my principal and vice principal. <coughs> they work extremely hard every day to improve our school. I'm not here to undermine their efforts in any way. But our school is not perfect. No school is. There are issues that stem from deep inside the school culture. Issues with sexism, racism, homophobia, and more. I've been witness to these, I've seen these, and I've heard about them. Many are working diligently to fix them, but more work can always be done. The Respect team recently hosted a Bridges Dinner, which aimed to bring diverse members of our community together for a meal and to be able to get to know each other. 
Everyone brought a dish representative of their heritage, and we had people sit with someone they didn't know. In all honesty, we had no clue how it would go. It was a monumental success. We had more than enough food, and the cafeteria was packed. I still have people approaching me to say, when are you hosting another dinner? Tell me more about your team. What are you guys, what are you guys doing in the school? It's moments like that when I feel especially proud of our school and community. I truly believe we are moving in the right direction and that this resolution will only serve to strengthen our commitment to respecting, protecting, and including all diverse members of our school and community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Raina Sparks and I live at 14 Woodcrest Road. I am also a student at the high school, and so on a fairly regular basis, I hear without filter the words of students and faculty at Cape Elizabeth, uh, particularly as they pertain to race, gender, religion, and sexual orientation. I'm proud to say that many of the individuals in Cape Elizabeth make an active effort to remain respectful of others and their differences. But what's more striking to me is that when there is an ignorant or hostile comment, um, the person making that comment tends to display really no understanding of the effects that their words have on the members of our community. Last week, a classmate of mine scoffed at the idea that the Quran could be considered as holy as the Bible or the Torah. Another, in casual conversation, asserted that a gay member of our school could not compete as well in sports because of his sexual orientation, and still another endorsed the idea that immigrants should not be welcome in our community because they could be terrorists. These words are hurtful not only in their intolerance towards others, but in that they perpetuate the idea that not all students in Cape Elizabeth's school system have an equal right to learn, to feel safe and accepted, and to be provided with the opportunities that they need to thrive. I tutor English language learner students at Pond Cove, many of whom are permanent immigrants and some of whom hold a temporary visa. I found these kids to meet some of the most hardworking and brutally honest people that I've ever met, which is why I was particularly struck by something that was said to me this past winter. In the wake of some significant acts of racial animosity in our community and in the rest of the country, one of them turned to me and asked, why do they think I'm different? This idea that a student so young could feel the effects of racial and political animosity so profoundly really sends a message that something has to be done. The Cape Elizabeth community is responsible for guaranteeing all students in our school system a learning environment in which they feel safe, accepted, and appreciated, which is why this resolution is so crucial. I hope that in passing it, Cape Elizabeth will take action to remain and become a more open and accepting community towards all of our students and towards all of our community members. Thank you. Hi, I'm Halima Sheer, and um, I'm living on 41 Ocean House Road. And um, this is a spoken word that I wrote when I was in middle school, um, in sixth grade when I was targeted. Here I sit on the floor, crying so much more, trying to erase this pain, trying to forget your face. Sitting here thinking, why do you think I'm that kind of person? A terrorist. I feel like my bones are cracking and blood is dripping down those cracks. I'm sitting here behind my back behind my door so no one comes in seeing me crying. I don't know how to handle myself nor the pain and suffering of my heart. How can others be cruel? They join in because they think it's fun not knowing the harm they do to me or anyone else. Stand up to them. Don't let them get away, or you and I may not see another day. You should know bullying hurts. It starts with one word, one word you blurt. Fat, ugly, worthless, these are the words I hear. Do you know you're my biggest fear? I am the voice of those afraid to speak. Those of us that society calls weak. Those who are ridiculed every day the ones who have nothing to say. We have feelings too, okay? The pain it hurts and rips and tears, unstoppable, but I don't care. All the lies about me, all the tears that have come, they're from you and the thing you've become. They point their fingers and laugh. 
As I make my way down the hall, I keep my eyes on the floor and try to ignore them all. I make my way through the day, wishing for someone to understand. I want someone to talk to. I need someone to lend me a hand. Each night I cry myself to sleep. How can people be so cruel? Everyone makes fun of me just because I'm new at school. I wake up to my alarm going off. Another day, another scar. I skip breakfast again, scared to go to school because of the bullies, scared to see them every single day. I don't know how to stop this. The school day is finally over, I head home. I get on my computer to check my messages, then it finally hits me. I will never be accepted. Message after message, I read each one. These bullies followed me home. You did it all for fun. You didn't know what could have been done. What if you pushed me a bit too far? All your actions have caused one big scar. Have you seen what you put me through? You think I am weak, but I am stronger than you. All I want to do is forget. I think, how much worse can I get? Don't you know you're my biggest fear? I scream so loud, but no one can hear. What if it was you who got hurt every day? Tell me how many words you would have left to say. So before judging me on my weight, my headscarf, my religion, just take a moment and realize and see everyone is not always who they seem to be. Stand up to them. Don't let them get away. Or you and I may not see another day. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jill Frame, and I live at 4 Dermot Drive with my husband, Greg, and our two children, Lily, who you just heard from a few moments ago, who's a 10th grader at Cape High School, and Jake, who's in 7th grade at the middle school. Like many others, I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the proposed resolution. Our family moved to Cape Elizabeth from South Portland eight years ago. We loved South Portland. We especially loved Lily's Elementary School, which at the time was the center of the community's ELL program. As we outgrew our home and were in the process of deciding whether to stay in South Portland or move to Cape, we found ourselves really struggling with the idea of leaving a community as diverse as South Portland to come to Cape where the perception was that there was very little diversity. However, as we began exploring neighborhoods, we were excited to learn that there was land for sale in a neighborhood that included families from Spain, France, Estonia, Canada, India, and Thailand, to name a few, as well as families with same-sex partners and many families who practice numerous religions. This, in combination with Cape's reputation for ex educational excellence, made our decision all the easier, and we have never looked back. Over the years, our diverse neighborhood has grown to include close to 60 school-aged children. To see them all playing together as they wait for the bus and again, every day after school is heartwarming. Our neighborhood gatherings have introduced us to cultural celebrations and cuisine from around the world. We are truly blessed to live in our neighborhood and in Cape Elizabeth. The first of four identified core values at Cape Elizabeth High School is community, which the follow with the following descriptor. Quote, we value rich and varied connections among our school, local, and global communities that foster meaningful participation in a dynamic and diverse world, end quote. The resolution before you tonight is an important step towards recognizing and upholding this specific core value. All children deserve to go to school each day in an environment where they feel included, respected, safe, and valued, and I thank you in advance for your support. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm Greg Frame. I'm the incredibly proud uh, husband of Jill and father of Lillian, who's amazing, and um, Jake. Um, I, I'm here in support of this resolution. I love the fact that it provides a line in the sand as to what we want to be as a community, that we want to be inclusive, that if this resolution just encourages one teacher to be more inclusive in their classroom and their teachings, or one teacher to come here, or empowers one student 
to speak up for themselves or to speak up for someone else, that would be a wonderful thing. I'm not so naive to think that this will stop racist or sexist comments, but I think it provides a tone for what we want to be, what I think we are as a community, and what we want to be as a community. In my other life, besides being a father and a, a lawyer, I'm a coach. And as you coach, you try to bring diverse groups of kids together, and hopefully at some point in time have a, common, a commonality where it's just us. It's not us and them on the team. And really, I think this resolution creates one cape where it's just us. It's not us versus them. So I really encourage you uh, to support this. Uh, there's simply no negative to this resolution, only positives. And I appreciate your uh, consideration of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Last but not the least. I did not prepare myself, but I'm going to tell you my life story in three minutes. I'm 46 What's years your old. your name and address? All right. Uh, my name is Mohammed Nasser Sheer, and I live at 41 Ocean House Road. My brother lives across the street, and I like to call it that we are the gatekeepers of the Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> so a lot of people are coming from South Portland, which is nice. Uh, so I'm going to tell you my life story based around schools, and hopefully it will be less than three minutes. Um, I'm originally from Afghanistan, moved to Pakistan as a refugee due to the Soviet Union uh, war. Um, lived there for 10 years, came to Maine, as, because Maine is a refugee to Saddamon State. And I had to learn, at age 13-ish, I had to learn English basically from scratch. I was lucky and privileged to go to King Middle School. Um, I was also wise, so I had a wise teacher who encouraged me to stay back, so I stayed back at King Middle School so I could go to Wayne Fleet. And Wayne Fleet is basically who made me. Uh, it, the environment was an inspiration. They asked the question who I was, where I was from, so based on those questions from teachers, from, from coaches, from students, I was able to learn about my religion and I was able to be proud of it as well. And I like to see that more often in this school. So after Wayne Fleet, I went to Clark University, came back to, you, to work at uh, Maine, and I got, I got a master's degree at, uh, from Muskie Schools as well. In 1997, uh, we chose to live in Cape Elizabeth. So we've lived here since 1997. I got five kids. My brother has five kids. My other brother has two. Sister has four. So we are here, and we will have, hopefully, at least you will see the Sheer family have an impact on the schools. Uh, I've also had the privilege of taking my kids outside of uh, this country. We've lived with the, my kids had a school system in Afghanistan when I was working for the UN. They had a school system in Pakistan, and they were in a school system in Dubai. And uh, we came back to choose in Cape Elizabeth. We chose Cape Elizabeth over other schools in the region. And I hope the ranking will increase, because that was one of my reasons I was we were here. This should be our least worry about uh, what we're we going through right now. So I'd like to reiterate that me being a Muslim, being a male, being Muhammad, I'm thus my racial profile that I care around with me, has no issues with me. I survived 9-11, and I say I can survive Trump administration, pretty much. Uh, but the Trump administration, or the new administration, or because of him, that administration is reaching my house. That administration is reaching my kids. That administration is giving the individuals the rights, not the rights. Uh, they're unleashing anger. Uh, when the, the president was elected on the first day, uh, one of my child on the bus was told, to go back where you come from. Sixth grader. Other child was told indirectly in a hallway that now that we have a new president, all Muslims will be deported. 
So my immediate action was talking to Mr. Shad, superintendent, and so forth. We had lovely meetings. We created a CDC group, Cape Diversity Group, out of it. We did not take any action or discipline against the kids. And this resolution we put forefront for you. I'm sorry, but I'm very, very pessimistic. I'm not optimistic. And I'm only pessimistic because last Monday in this group, same chairs, different people, totally, totally denied the resolution or admitting to that it was supposed to be passed. So based on that, I am very, very pessimistic. But I was told this is a different group. These are my allies. You guys be welcoming me. So I look forward to how you guys vote. So my name is Jeff Shedd. Um, I happen to be the principal at the high school, but I'm also a resident of Cape Elizabeth and have been happily for the last 25 years, I think. I live at 6 Linwood Street. So I was uncertain whether or not in my role as principal I'd have an opportunity to speak, so I thought I'd say a couple words. Um, first of all, I will say bottom line is I think I, think I, I completely support this resolution. Um, I think, I think uh, I'm also a history teacher. Um, and in 1954, the Supreme Court passed, the Supreme Court decided Brown versus Board of Education, which ordered desegregation of schools. It took a lot of repetition and a lot of time before that message sunk in and truly affected the decisions that individuals make and towns make and neighborhoods make and schools make and everybody makes. So it seems to me that even though this resolution may be a little bit short of action and about words, that's really the beginning point of change, is, is words and repetition, um, and there's never enough repetition. So I think, I think it, does, it sends a great message. Um, I wanted to stand up here, particularly after Lily and Raina and, and Halima came up and stood to show that um, there are many adults with them at Cape Elizabeth High School. There are areas where we can do a better job. Um, I think we do a quite good job responding to issues of bullying and harassment and those sorts of things. And I think we're beginning to do a better job of actually celebrating diversity and celebrating culture, cultural differences and inviting differences of opinion and that sort of thing. But I think this, is a, this, this resolution is a wonderful reminder to take a more proactive, active role in sort of doing more work along the lines of the Bridges Dinner and, and other things as well. I will say I wanted to second one thing that Jim Sparks said um, because I support the entire resolution. I um, am not an expert on immigration law, so I leave that for others, but I support everything in the resolution. I do want to draw attention to the same um, paragraph that Jim Sparks did as well, which spoke to the issues of tolerance of different political viewpoints. Because I think one of the things as a nation, and in the, short, in the aftermath of November that we as a school struggled with is tolerance for diverse viewpoints, even on popular viewpoints. Um, and sometimes, sometimes we are tempted to be intolerant in the name of diversity and tolerance. And it's a sort of an unusual struggle. I've read two articles in the last two days, one in Atlantic, one in Politico, two pretty progressive publications talking about how college campuses are struggling with being welcoming to controversial minority viewpoints. And I think that's one of the things that I like about this resolution. It sort of at least indirectly alludes to how can we do a better job making sure everybody ethnic, religious groups, relig um, cultural groups, socioeconomic groups, but people who have different minority political viewpoints as well, which some may perceive as intolerant. How do we build a culture in which we can listen to everybody respectfully? So I stand in complete support of the resolution. Thank you. Um, since everybody has spoken just now, I, I'd like to recommend that we move um, the resolution to um, discussion and a, hopefully a vote tonight. Um, that's my motion. So you're moving it to an action item? I'd like to move it to an action item for tonight, yes. 
be adopted. To be adopted. A second. Should the board at that motion then do our discussion point after the motion for the resolution? So at this time, we're just, Suzanne is just moving to have it put on as an action item. We can probably discuss whether or not we want it moved to an action item now, but not the actual mm -hmm. discussion. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Okay. So I'd like to say that I, I believe that now is the time to move it to an action item. Um, we uh, have heard from various people from the schools, from the community, um, and I believe there's no time like the present to make a positive symbolic statement. And I would really um, like to get this um, agenda, this, this resolution on the agenda so that uh, members of the of the Cape Diversity Community and members of the community at large um, know that they have the support of the school. I'm busily writing. So. Editing the agenda. <coughs> Do you need a vote? For the discussion? For the agenda. Oh. Finalizing it's moved to the agenda. Any further discussion about moving it to the agenda? Um, so I, I um, I think it's the right thing to do to, to, to address this sooner as we have a lot of interested community members. Um, I think there's some complexities to the discussion um, and that, uh, I'm in favor of moving that, that that forward. I would vote to do that. I, I would also um, like to, to propose um, uh, not an alternative, but uh, additional uh, resolution that I think that we may be able to uh, um, that was simpler, that is able to show the support that we feel for their goals, um, and then we can um, address uh, some of the complexities of the of resolution that uh, has been proposed. So, so uh, I'll repeat what I said. I think this is the time to discuss this. I think it's a, it, the, the resolution that, is, uh, that we would be moving up in the, in the agenda is complex. Uh, I think there are uh, some challenges in, in that and that will come up in the discussion. And I, um, I would, um, I will shortly propose that um, a, a additional resolution that uh, covers some of the points where I think there is, there will be full agreement, um, uh, and so that we can start from a place where we are all in agreement and all can be supportive of the goals that are proposed. So. So the motion on the table is still further up. discussion. Yeah. Is there any further discussion? I just had a clarification. Are you looking to move it from communications to the first item of new business? That's what I would propose. You want the first, yes. first, first item of okay. new business? That makes sense. Okay. Okay. That is the most excellent idea, Barbara, as we do have the audience, I think the majority yeah. are here for that agenda item right. to make them sit. I just would like it to be in the proper place and really have it be part of our new business because it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You, take over. you can finish this one. Okay. So no further discussion on moving it to the agenda? Okay. All those in favor? Moving it to the agenda, first item under 6A? 6? Opposed. Anybody opposed? Okay. Okay. Kind of like making sausage. So at this time, um, I would like to thank the public and um, also give my apologies in my other role. I'm a coach for another town and I was on a bus coming from Marshwood High School. <laughs> Got here as soon as I could. Thank you. Um, moving on, um, 
to communications. Um, we have, um, is Mr. Shedd prepared to do a, a, a brief discussion of the U.S. News and World Report Best High Schools? A little clarification? Right. Great. So every year, U.S. News um, ranks, ranks high schools, um, comes out with the best high schools list. Um, since it's been doing that, I think, I think Cape Elizabeth High School has been on it probably every year. Um, and I fully expect that we will be on it again. Um, I know that both before, so the rankings, that recently came out from U.S. News were based on the 2014 to 15 test. Um, both before and after 2014 and 2000, that school year, 2014 to 15, um, our students um, take have take have taken and continue to take standardized tests very seriously. In fact, if anything, I worry <coughs> that sometimes they take them too seriously, but they take them really really seriously. Um, so I think it's a legitimate question that the community should ask and that the community member who addressed the board a little while ago should ask about why, why, why is this? Um, and I don't want to be heard in any way to suggest, to be interpreted to suggest that there aren't good questions that, that should be asked about that year um, and that there aren't good questions that should be asked always about whether we are doing everything we can to help students take seriously the things that, that count for them and for the school. Um, but both before and after, uh, at least within the last seven to eight years, bef before the 2014-15 test and after, Cape Elizabeth High School has been in the top three of every, sec every school tested in the state on the SATs in reading and writing and math. And that was true most recently as well. It's been true the last two years. In fact, most of those years, our students have scored the highest of any public school in the state in every single one of those areas, or tied for the highest. Um, we were actually a little bit lower this most recent year. Um, we were in the top three, top two in a couple of areas, and top three in another. And we have looked at that really carefully, because we want to make sure that that's not a reflection of uh, anything that we can't be doing a better job of. But, so getting to 2014 to 15, um, I cannot explain to the board, I cannot adequately answer the question of how the dynamic began to take place in Cape Elizabeth back then, where parents very early on started opting their students out of the Smarter Balance test, as they legally were entitled to do. But it started very early, and it continued right up until the day of the test, to the point that only between, and I, I could get the numbers, uh, but I know for a fact that only between 40 and 60 percent of our kids even took the test. I think it was a little bit less than 50 percent of our kids even took the test. The rest of the parents opted their students out of the test. So what happens is it's one of those things when you reach a critical mass of students and families who communicate pretty clearly through their actions um, that they don't take the test seriously. And perhaps I should have done a better job trying to sell, sell the smarter balance test, looking back on it. Um, but it wasn't for lack of interest in standardized tests in general that perhaps I, I didn't do as good a job as I should have. But we reached a critical mass very early and it just kept going right downhill and, and the test sessions itself, which I was at. Um, it was very obvious that um, the majority of students who were there, because the test didn't count anything for them, um, it made absolutely no difference to anything um, for them. Uh, that they were putting in a minimal, if any, effort into the test. They perceived themselves as having been forced by their parents while their friends were out um, doing whatever their friends were doing um, on a relatively nice day, as I remember, um, taking, a, taking a really, really, really long standardized test. That result, I will say, I don't think it reflects in any way on any decline in standards at Cape Elizabeth High School. I think every year the parents and citizens, community members, um, board members should be asking questions. If we're, there are showing signs of slipping, I expect hard questions to be asked. We ask those of ourselves. 
Our teachers spend a long time looking at those tests. Um, I was one of the few principals way back when, um, when Maine adopted a, a statewide test. I loved the fact that it was the SAT. I think I was probably in a handful of about a, half, a handful of principals across the state who loved the fact that it was the SAT. And the reason is because I knew that the culture of our community and school was that our students took it seriously. I was thrilled when the state made a decision to go back to the SAT as their standardized test. Not to say that the SAT is the final measure of everything that a student has learned or that it gets at everything that we, is, we want to have our students learn in a good school. Um, standardized tests have limits. They can't do all of that. Um, but I was thrilled when we went to it. I was not thrilled when we went away from it. Perhaps people read my, my lack of, I've written op-ed pieces to the Portland Press Herald and testified in front of the legislature about why I think they made the right decision and why they made the right decision to go back to it. Um, so I, I can't explain why some, obviously some students and families in some schools took that test more seriously than we did, clearly, because they outscored us. Um, but I can just tell you that that was the dynamic that developed in Cape Elizabeth that resulted in, I'm pretty sure it was less than half of our kids taking the test and most of the ones who took it not taking it seriously. I remember really distinctly talking to one girl in particular after the test. She worked until the bitter end on every section of the test um, and I applauded her and sort of wondered why did she do that um, when her friends weren't doing that. Um, but that was the experience with the Smarter Balance test. U.S. News, by the way, I will explain sort of the rankings. There is a, there is a process and the first step in the process of determining whether or not a student gets ranked is um, whatever the state standardized assessment is that states used, um, the results are reported by the state to U.S. News. Um, then they look at the socioeconomic um, numbers in that particular community um, and, they, and they sort of create a graph that says here's the socioeconomic uh, numbers for all of these schools um, and then they look at here's the performance of the school based on that socioeconomic number and I believe the number is in order to be even get through that first filtering uh, process a school has to be one-third of a standard deviation at least above the norm uh, on that test. Then the next step, which we didn't get to because we got knocked out in the first step, which I, has certainly never happened before, is to look at the results of students um, on either international baccalaureate exams, which we don't give, or advanced placement exams. Um, and, and so U.S. News just didn't get to that um, with, with our students. Um, I will say that I think the Washington Post Challenge Index recently came out the other day because I actually didn't look at it, but I got an email that suggested to me that I believe we've made a best high schools list for the Washington, on, based, uh, Jay Matthews used to work with Newsweek. Newsweek used to have a competing best high schools list. Um, Newsweek has sort of gotten away from that business, so the Washington Post um, has continued it with Jay Matthews, who's a reporter. Um, who assembles that list, and I, I actually didn't click the link, cause, but I'm pretty sure it was telling me that we had made, made that list again. So um, continue to ask good questions, continue to ask hard questions. Um, if we didn't do a very good job explaining the importance of that test and we're motivating our students to do it, then uh, that's our bad, that's my bad as the leader of the school, but that's what happened that year. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Questions? I just had a quick comment. My recollection, Jeff, is that in that same year, a similar opt-out was occurring in another very high-performing school that also didn't make the list. Right. So I think a couple of us that always makes the list that as well out of the SAT, which it felt like an authentic reason to put a lot of effort into kids. It is hard to explain. I understand, but I think two of us fell into that yep. trap. Mm. Yes, at least. I'm wondering about also the timing in which our district took the Smarter Balance test. Are, is the Smarter Balance offered like the SAT all on one day? Yes, it was. Um, well, it was actually offered over a few school days because it was a significantly longer test than the SATs. Mm -hmm. I don't think we did it on a Saturday, although I, I, I don't think we did. I think it was so the students who came were coming while other students were not in, were not in school because um, we had late start days uh, so in order the to be able to. the window is uniform. Every, yes, it was uniform. And everybody, 
Um, I'm not sure that everybody gave it on the very same days. I think there was a testing window. Um, when we do the school, um, school required SAT for all juniors, that is given on a designated day. Um, Smarter Balanced was given um, in a, a, a range of dates. Um, yeah, and I think we selected, I know we weren't in the beginning. I think we opted to go a little bit closer to the end. I don't think we were at the very tail end. Um, and I do remember that midway through our testing window, as our kids were taking the test, the state announced that they were not going to continue the test for another year. Um, the test does still exist. I think a few, a few states still give it, but it's, it, it hasn't been, um, a, a lot more states are going to either the ACT or the SAT precisely because um, they know that students take it seriously and those are fair measures of what students are learning to the extent that standardized tests are capable of, of teasing that out. I'm wondering if you think that the state's announcement that they weren't going to be continuing with the Smarter Balance had an effect on the student population taking the test after that. Yeah, I remember the chronology. I, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to know that for certain. I was just going to say, you, you bring up a really valid point about um, kind of the, the narrow way they define what, is the, the be, what are the best schools. It's kind of interesting. It, I think that year in particular and any year, those particular tests don't necessarily show the, the wide range of what good learning is going on here or anywhere. Yeah, and I know even though um, uh, they haven't yet been looked at in terms of for the U.S. News rankings, um, I do know that the subsequent SATs that our students took, our students were back where we, where we would normally expect them to be. And I also think it's interesting that the new U.S. News and World Report, their second filter in the rankings is to do with how our students perform on the APs, and there are several private schools that don't offer AP courses, and yet are considered most excellent. So it's kind yeah, of an a, interesting. That's a good question. I don't know how they, how they actually make those determinations, John. I should take a look at that. I did read through their methodologies to the extent they were going to affect us, but I didn't didn't take a look at it with that question in mind. Thanks for clarifying. You're very welcome. So moving on to item B, which is um, an update on the school board budget presentation to town council. Um, on Tuesday, April 25th, the school board presented its 2017-2018 budget to town council. <laughs> The major considerations of the budget include student intervention and support, care and preservation of facilities, K-12 curriculum alignment, climate and culture, proficiency-based education, the evaluation system, and careful resource allocation. Our spending, staffing, and programming decisions are entirely driven by student need. And while our enrollment has been relatively flat or slightly declining over the last several years, student need has been expanding exponentially in the form of individualized health plans, 504s, um, struggling students, um, gifted and talented students, special ed students with a, a wide range of complex diagnoses and needs. Um, we deliver top-notch education and meet those needs while still having one of the absolute lowest cost per pupil in our area. The town council asked deep and thoughtful questions and were particularly interested in past and future, past and future capital improvement projects. The facilities director was asked to submit a list of completed CIP projects to the town council for their review. And town councilor, I mean, town council chair Jamie Garvin suggested that the town council take a yearly tour of all schools and all other town facilities um, to have a better understanding of these um, properties that about which they make decisions. There were also questions about class size and staffing levels that evening. Toward the end of the evening, Town Council Finance Chair Jessica Sullivan gave a prepared presentation and suggested that the council direct the school board to cut 1% from its budget, not based on what she saw as frivolous spending, but as a way to simply decrease the tax impact. There was a heated discussion around this proposal 
And in the end, the town council took a straw poll to move the school budget as presented to the next stage of the process. The outcome was a 5-2. And the next step was public hearing, which was last night. On Monday, May 8th, the town council held a public hearing on all parts of the municipal budget, which includes the school department. The next step in that process happens next Monday, May 15th. The town council is slated to vote to send the budget to public referendum. That referendum is scheduled for June 13th. And moving on to item C, we have moved that to an action item. So we're going to cross that off. Item 5D, Dick Elizabeth graduation standard. Ms. Stang. Yes, I'm delighted to bring to your attention a draft of Cape Elizabeth's graduation standards. Um, as you well know, eventually our students, um, in order to graduate from Cape Elizabeth High School, are going to have to demonstrate proficiency to a set of standards in eight content areas. And so our high school teachers have been working really, really hard this year to uh, come up with um, uh, a, a set of standards that represent what they believe our students should understand, know, and be able to do before they graduate. Uh, these standards are aligned to the main learning results, and, uh, and as well as having been drafted by the high school teachers, they have been vetted by the middle school teachers. And eventually, all of our curriculum will be aligned to these standards. I encourage you to read them at your leisure and um, let me know if you have any questions. Are there any questions at this time? I'm sure we will be circling back. Yes, no doubt. <coughs> Moving on to item 5E, the superintendent's report. I am not Howard Coulter, <laughs> however. <laughs> He left notes for me. Uh, so I'd like to start by uh, <coughs> announcing a retirement and two resignations. Anthony Gidoni, Tony Gidoni, who is a math teacher at the high school, is retiring this year. And Greg Marles and Faith Barnes. Greg, our director of facilities in Faith Barnes, uh, social worker at Pond Cove, um, have both resigned. So we will miss them and begin the search shortly. Uh, which is the second item. Uh, Howard will be requesting a meeting with town manager Matt Sturgis to review buildings and grounds needs prior to posting the vacancy for the new facilities director. And he is going to ask for a board member or two to join him for that meeting. So he'll be in touch with you then about that shortly when he gets back. And then you are cordially invited to the Cape Elizabeth High School graduation, which will be on Sunday, June 11th from 1 to 3 p.m., weather permitting at Fort Williams, and I'm not sure what happens if... Chimneys. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't put that on there. Uh, he wanted you to know that evaluations have been completed for each department head, the principals, and the central office administrators. I'm sure he's very glad to have scratched that off his list. <laughs> Um, work is ongoing to improve and update our emergency response plan for the school district. His goal is to have an emergency response plan in place next fall. Uh, coming up next, uh, we will practice specific drills throughout the school year with the assistance of our fire and police departments. And finally, He's become aware that there are rumors, uh, rumors alive and well, that he has a plan to subcontract out work, uh, work such as custodial and maintenance. Um, and he wanted to reassure the community that nothing could be further from the truth, that those rumors are, are completely baseless. All right, that's the news from Howard Coulter. Moving on to new business. I move that we uh, vote and uh, uh, move that we approve the resolution presented to the school board by the Cape Diversity Coalition. Oh, second. 
Sorry, I was thinking about something completely in my head. Is it to approve or to support? Approve and support. Okay. <laughs> I'm not really sure about the, the language. So let's have discussion. I have a, a note here from um, Heather Altenberg who was unable to join us this evening, although she felt strongly enough to ensure that her voice was heard on this resolution. Uh, because Heather is unable to be at the school board meeting this evening, she would like to express her full support for the diversity resolution being considered for a vote this evening. There has been a lot of dedication to creating this very thoughtful resolution that celebrates our differences and helps us unite as a community. Clearly stating an intention to cultivate a community that is more tolerant, more accepting, and more compassionate will only help to support a stronger environment of interconnectedness. If she were here tonight, she would be proudly voting yes to this courageous and inclusive resolution. Thank you. I have some, so let me start out by saying um, this resolution is, is, uh, is very conflicting to me, but I want to put that aside for a second and say I am very heartened and very encouraged by the group that's come together to put this forward. I am very supportive and, uh, of, of their goals, of their energy, of their commitment, and what they're trying to achieve. Um, and. Uh, um, I think that you are right to point out that you know this is a time where we need to be able to stand together and be visible and 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 make those kind of statements that we stand for non-discrimination we stand for a safe environment we stand for free speech we stand for civil discourse those are really really important um, so um, with that said, Jeff Shedd mentioned a couple of things about repetition, and and I tend I agree with him and talked about Brown versus Board of Education and that rep repetition it took to get that right, and that's really really true, really really true on messaging, on messaging it's a really good thing you've got to say something over and over and over again and pe till people get it. The challenge is repetition is actually not so great for policy. You don't have two different ways that you handle an invoice. You don't have two different ways you do things. And there's a number of things in the resolution that address policy concerns. And we have an existing policy process. It's a really good one that gets input from all the people. Now, this has had some input, but it hasn't had the input that we normally um, have when we have a school policy. That's the people on the front lines who are going to have to implement that policy. The, our attorneys who will give us advice about the legal implications of the things that we may do. Um, so as much as I'm really for and, and delighted by the energy and community enthusiasm around this, and I support that and want to embrace it, I'm very cautious about um, circumventing what has been a very um, robust policy-making process that we've embraced. You know, if you read through how we make policy, it's in our, in our policy, this is not how we do that. And there are things in this resolution that commit us to do things that would look like policies. Um, that being said, as it, uh, I come from and grew up in an environment that had a great deal of diversity. I celebrate diversity. I encourage diversity. I encourage free speech. I encourage non-discrimination. And what I see here is an effort that puts in place policies and things that are redundant for many of the things we already have. And what we need is how we take your energy and revitalize those policies, most of which sit in our policy manual today about not discriminating, about creating civil discourse, about creating a safe environment. They're there. And what you're telling us and we want to hear is these don't have life in our school system. 
That's what we need to change. Putting these words in place here and then circumventing what's a good policy process may not get us where we want to go. I want to go where this group wants to go. I'm not sure this is going to get us there. I would, so with that in mind, and I'm not sure the correct procedure to do this, what I would like to do is to offer a, a, a substitute or additional amendment, which is something I can fully get behind and to demonstrate very publicly that I support what's going on, but I don't feel that circumvents our important policy process. So. Um, I'm, full, I'm fine to sort of, to, uh, so I would offer as a substitute amendment the, the, the following and, and not just, you know, I would actually prefer to ha have the vote and be on the record with the full process, but I would offer something that I think that I can fully stand behind. Um, and so I'd like to offer that amendment, uh, substitute so amendment. would you be willing for people yeah. to continue discussion yeah. on the current uh, motion on the table? Yes. Uh, but before we vote? Offer your amendment. So, yeah, and I'm not sure how to get there procedurally. My preference would be to start from one I, know, I hope that we could all agree on and then proceed to one where there may be um, some, some more nuance. Mm -hmm. Because I'd like to start from a place where we all agree this is important and we want to do this. Um, but I am respectful of how we need to make decisions as a school, as a school board, and it, 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 th that process is there for good reasons. and. It works really well. Um, and that doesn't mean we're not going to get where you guys want to go, but th there are ways to get there. This may not be that way. So. Um, may I speak? Oh, sure. Oh, were you going to say something? Well, um, I, I don't want to conclude discussion at this time, and um, I see this as a commitment to philosophy. And um, I, too, have some concerns around particularly number seven and eight. Um, only because they commit to particular action which might need to be in policy. So that actually was a concern of mine as well. Um, not that I don't believe in them, and um, it, that would, that is a, that's a concern. That's just where I'm coming from. Uh, sorry. Oh, so sorry. I, I, I believe that in policies, um, in several of our policies, the AC, ACAA, JB, JFABD, they all, they all refer to the legal authority that the school has to protect its students. That um, if law enforcement comes to the school asking to question, that the school does not have to abide by that. So we've also checked with um, legal, um, with lawyers that are work on immigration and have verified that. Um, so we're not out of bounds in any way. And in terms of the policy, the policy supports these exact same points. Um, so, yeah. I'd also like to add, with due respect, John, um, that there's room for both policy <coughs> and for resolution. And this resolution um, does not circumvent policy whatsoever. It is, in addition to it, this is a symbolic statement um, that is proposed by a, a community, community group we are here to support it. Um, that said, I would like to make my comments also. This is the time to do it. I wanted to thank all the members of the public who came to address the board tonight. Your compassion and bravery are truly inspiring. I would also like to thank the members of the Cape Diversity Coalition for their dedication, thoughtfulness, and perseverance. I am grateful that the coalition has brought this resolution to the attention of our schools and our community. While our schools already have several policies in place and a solid record of positive initiatives that reflect the district's commitment to protecting the rights of students and staff from discrimination of various forms, the need for a resolution such as presented tonight is equally critical. Considering the times in which we currently live, where we have seen a rise in intolerance, hateful acts, and fear, we are obliged to go beyond our policies. We must seize the opportunity we have before us and connect our policies with this proactive and symbolic commitment to welcoming and protecting the rights of any and all of our students. No matter what their religion, sexual orientation, or political leanings may be, our schools educate and serve everyone who comes to its doorstep. Students and families must never doubt this. 
I fully support this resolution and believe that as elected officials, we are bound to protect and defend the rights of all our community members, whether they be students in our schools or not. Furthermore, though there have been some community members that have argued that this is simply a school-based issue, I believe that it applies and should apply to the entire community. Yes, children reflect what they learn at school, but they also reflect what they learn at home and the values supported in their community. There is no separating students from community or community from students. Our schools and our community must model the values we expect our children to embrace. Tonight, I encourage my fellow board members to vote in favor of this resolution, to model to our students that hate is not tolerable and silence is cowardly, and that the best way to serve the entire community is by being beacons of life, liberty, and light. So, I first just want to say that um, this is probably one of the most compelling moments that has come before me as a school board member. I've been a school board member now for six years. And as a community and as a society and as individuals, we cannot change what the world does. We cannot change other people's actions. We cannot change what other people decide to do or say. What we do have control over, however, is our reactions to that world and to what other people's thoughts and feelings and their effects on us and how we decide to move forward and shape our world regardless of that. And in that respect, I'm incredibly proud of the work that, that has been gone into this resolution. I'm also incredibly proud of the fact and, and incredibly supportive of the Cape Diversity Coalition for the work that you've put forward in drafting this resolution as well as the work that you are clearly committed to do in moving forward and ensuring that this resolution isn't just a simple vote, or it isn't a simple piece of paper, but it is a way in which we decide that we as a community are going to move forward as a society. And that becoming that example for others, I I'm, could not be more proud than to be part of this community with you. Thank you. After reading the resolution, I support um, not only um, you know, this section number six, which is why I had asked on whether this was a vote in support of the resolution or if this is a vote in adopting the resolution. Mm -hmm. And in choosing those two words, I think that one compels us to move forward and enact the things that are in this resolution, and another one supports the idea that maybe we should go move forward and explore which parts of this resolution we can pick up and run with right away, and what parts of this resolution may need to hit the pause button, consult with those who are more familiar with immigrant law, immigration law. I am not an expert. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel policy. And, and exactly. Um, and you know, even sort of you know, number six, supporting the adoption of school curriculum that, that um, as it states, commits to setting an educational curriculum that reflects the values of tolerance, diversity, and inclusion, I would hope that's already in existence. Um, and as far as um, number seven, unless compelled to do so by court order, it does protect us, but I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, and I certainly don't know school law, so I, I can't say that I can support that that actually is going to happen. I, I, I wouldn't be able to be at my top of my practice promise that of you. And then for number eight, declaring um, the schools as a safe haven, I, I, I support that notion. I just don't know if by law that we're able to do that and, and whether that can still go through the proper channels with policy. Um, I would move that perhaps to change the motion to say that we do support um, the ideas of this resolution and that we are committed to moving forward to bringing as much of this to life that we are legally able to, um, given our legal authority as a school board. So you're amending your own motion. Do you accept your, or was it your motion? I made the motion. Okay, so she's. I had asked for clarity. I wasn't. Yeah, yeah and we didn't. We didn't do a good job with that. Okay. Clarifying. So um, you're asking to amend the motion to say support rather than adopt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to comment on that. Um, I don't have articulate comments made. I read through this. It seemed that it felt like something 
I would like to use the word affirm, affirm and support. We deeply believe with the goals of this resolution. I frankly, as the policy chair and with some experience with this, feel comfortable with these action steps, including that we are not required to furnish the police or the immigration authorities a place in our schools to talk with children about their immigration status. No. They have homes, they have other places. I think we can hold the school sacred, personally. But I do agree that if we use the words affirm and support, we're giving ourselves the ability to look deeply at each of these action steps, even though I really and truly believe they are um, positive and doable. So I would, um, I would vote to, in the positive, to affirm and support this resolution. Susanna, do you accept the amendment? I do accept the amendment to include affirm and accept, or er, support. <laughs> so we would make note that it would say affirm and support. Jody? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Barbara, for that so, clarity. And I appreciate Barbara because I wanted to circle back around. I reserved my comments usually to the end, but I wanted to check in with you as policy chair to get your feeling about this. To me, if we are affirming this any time a policy comes to us now yep. that incorporates any of these issues, the affirmation of the board directs the policy yep. as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So I, I like having these kinds of words behind our work. Yes. I just want to speak to the proposed amendment. I fully support the, the, that, that amendment. Thank you. I want to say thank you uh, for all the hard work put into putting this together and the courage and strength of everyone that came to share your thoughts on the resolution tonight. Uh, I think that is a, a great proposal and uh, I fully support it. So I too would like to thank the entire Cape Diversity Coalition for their hard work on this. It's it's. It's been a long time, and, and um, I appreciate two people coming to this meeting and standing up and speaking. I know that it's, it's, it takes a lot of courage to get up and, and share your, your perspective and share your pain, and I'm, I'm just, I'm in awe to see students and adults come together in this community and um, bring this to us, and I thank you. I am in full support of this entire document and uh, I really appreciate the amendment because I believe we can affirm and support and go forward and work with this. Any, is there further discussion? No, subsequent to this I'd like to offer an additional resolution if I may that allows us to even perhaps take a little more action, so subsequent. I'll make that, um, I'll make that request after the vote. Okay. <laughs> So, without further discussion, all those in favor? All those opposed? Six. And so, uh, I'd like to make a request to suspend the rules and amend the agenda to offer an additional um, resolution based upon our discussion this evening. Um, so based upon our discussion this evening, I, I also think that it's actually uh, it was important for the community to see the board come together and to actually act in addition to affirming and supporting what you're doing. And in that spirit, I would offer the following resolution that whereas we believe as elected officials, it is our duty to speak out on issues of community concern, especially as they relate to Cape Elizabeth schools, and whereas in the past several uh, months there's been nationwide rise in hate speech and violence and a decline in civil discourse, and in Cape Elizabeth there have been reports of several concerning incidents. Whereas there is heightened community concern about these issues, we therefore resolve that the board reaffirms its full commitment to its 
non-provision, so excuse me, it's commitment to non-discrimination, provision of a safe environment for all staff, students, and volunteers, and to free speech and civil discourse, as detailed in the current existing capable of the school policies. And we further, in light of the recent incidents, direct the superintendent to review the existing policies to determine if there are any non-discrimination, safety, or speech policies that need revision or strengthening and report back to the board as, as well as how to bring these policies to become a stronger part of our current school culture. Are you asking for that to be an addendum to the resolution? It's not an, um, it would not be, it could be an addendum, it could be a separate resolution, so. I'm not sure. I will take your advice as to how you would like to treat that. So the, the point that I'm, asked, I'm, I'm making is that I think we want to reaffirm our commitment to those existing policies and ask our superintendent to report back to us to say, we've looked at it. These we may need to strengthen or not strengthen. These are the things that we think we can do to make these a stronger part of our school culture, which is what we've talked about tonight, which is we have these words and these are things are still happening. So what actions do we take? How do we do that? Yeah. Barbara, you're probably more of an expert on this than I am, but I'm pondering process. I love the ideas that you've put forward. I'm wondering um, whether without putting something like that on an agenda for proper public notice and giving folks enough time to respond to that and, and give public feedback, um, perhaps draft a resolution and submit it for consideration at our next meeting so that it goes through those steps as well so in addition I, to? I'm fine with that. The, the impetus to me was to be able to take direct action in response to the community concern. And the action was essentially for the superintendent to look at these things. And I'm happy to simplify the language. So, well, I think yeah. the language is clear. I'm just worried about process. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you, Joanna, and I also um, very much appreciate that motion. It does yeah. spur us into actually doing something next. And I think I'm very sad that Howard Coulter isn't here tonight because he may have some further language that would strengthen it even more. Mm -hmm. So I'd like this draft resolution to be presented to the superintendent for okay. his feedback Agreed. and bring it to us in June. So uh, let me I just, suggest let me just, we table that. Into, uh, I, I yeah. think tabling it would be a good idea yeah. to start a process, yeah. but I just want to let you, everyone know um, that Howard has been a part of this coalition and it has read the um, revised the, the school resolution, so he's fully aware and has always been um, uh, an advocate for it, so. Well, that's, that's perfect, and then he, if he has further thoughts about practices and protocols in the school beyond policy that he thinks should be included in the right. review. And does it need to language. be an agenda item, or is mm -hmm. right. he direct, yep. is, there, yeah, is it enough for us to just direct him to act? Yep. Right. right. Great. Um, so we can table this item? Yep. With presentation? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Good thought. So, we have three lettered the rest of tonight's agenda. So we are moving on to item 6C, which is consideration to approve the superintendent's nominations. Thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll pause for a moment for the exit. <laughs> Item 6B, which was formerly known as item 6A. May I have a motion, please? Um, I move that we approve the superintendent's nomination of personnel to first continuing contracts. Heather Bouvier, high school teacher. A second. Discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> I was waiting for John. Okay. Gang of All those opposed. Thank you. That was six. Moving on to item 6C, consideration to approve the superintendent's nominations of new personnel. 
I move we approve the superintendent's <laughs> nomination for new personnel for the 2017-2018 school year. Um, AC Berkey, behavior specialist, as well as Sarah McGowan, high school mathematics teacher. Did I get those right? I second. I was really pleased to see such um, great quality candidates showing up in our packets and thrilled to be considering their names tonight. Further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Six. We, oh, we moved um, item, this item to the beginning of the evening. So we've already um, voted yep, on. Because Jessica had special. a comment, she was oh, sick, so we moved it up. So. So you don't want me to read that one again? Put a big check mark next to it and hope you guys have notes. So we're moving on to item 6E. And the reason I read them a little bit is so that we know where we are. Item 6E is consideration to approve the following policy for second reading. That was amended at the beginning of the meeting to read, review the following policy for second reading. Okay. I'm handing to you an updated uh, J. IJOC school volunteer policy following our last policy committee meeting. If anybody in the audience cares to have a copy, it's also on the back table. Let me bring you up to date about where we are with this work and why we asked for one more round before we bring you final language. The one you see in front of you is changed just slightly from what was in your packet, and I want to highlight, given your comments last time, uh, comments and suggestions from uh, some of our parent community who have had a chance to read the policy as well as the policy committee conversation the other night that included um, some really helpful guidance from Howard Coulter as well as continued in influence from our principals and John Holdridge. Um, we did go ahead in the volunteer policy and discuss how to talk about what a regular volunteer is so that our principals are aware of their role and responsibility in terms of being completely familiar with people in their school. And so that is now defined as a regular volunteers are those who come in on a frequent basis for a specific purpose. We're not saying weekly, we're not saying monthly, we're not saying twice weekly. It's just that it's a long standing commitment in a similar responsible area. So that's our hope that our principals will now be aware of all of those assignments. We also, uh, in discussion under volunteers who are approved to work with students, um, besides going to training sessions, they'll work with students under the supervision direction of authorized staff in the classroom or in a highly visible and accessible open setting. Uh, there's been some concern that the word um, immediate supervision was removed from this, and that wasn't intended to soften the policy whatsoever. It was intended to reflect the real practice that on occasion superintendents might be just outside in the hall or in a not school. What did I say? Superintendents. superintendents. Oh my goodness sake. He does need to be watched closely. See what happens when he's out of town. <laughs> sure. It's just getting no I'm, superintendents. I'm doing Barbara. this more often now. I'm substituting <laughs> words. There's really something going on in my brain. Anyway, the volunteers. Uh, be in a completely high traffic uh, area if they're going to be working with students. They're still under the direct supervision of teachers, but the word immediate to, to us interpreted as immediate visual. And we mean they're still completely responsible for volunteers, but they may be just slightly tucked around the door or again in a high traffic area, uh, particularly in the middle school. But in the high school also, there's a lot of volunteers who work with um, Oh, moot court and drama and so forth who might be in classrooms with a small group of kids scattered around the high school. Doors open, you know, um, just again, open and accessible is our theme for access. Uh, we then also down in number seven talked about uh, volunteers refrain from taking and posting photographs and or video of students using personal devices while serving in a volunteer capacity. Mm -hmm. Certainly a teacher may hand an iPad or a camera to someone and say, take this picture of me with the class on our field trip. That's a whole different subject. But, but use of personal devices, we are going to say no. 
Um, and, and then adding to that, number eight, which was not in your packet, this policy will be reviewed annually so that key provisions are highlighted for all staff as the new school year begins. Um, John's uh, indicated to principals that he's very happy to come around and be part of that process, um, but he really, um, we all felt it was important for this to have any teeth and merit. Teachers need to be completely on board with our expectations and policy around use of volunteers. Now, in addition to this work, which I would tell you from email from Howard, he's completely comfortable with background checks every five years and so forth to make sure that, um, that adults we have in the building are, are considered and vetted to be completely safe and great to be around kids. There is consider, considerable concern, and you've seen some emails, about whether or not fingerprinting should play any role in our vetting of volunteers. To that end, I sent an email to all of the Cumberland County Superintendent group saying, what's your practices in your district? John had done that, but I just sort of wanted to push superintendents a little harder. And I had nine responses. And in one case, there was a district that's been recently reviewing their volunteer group and just decided to uh, include, no one else in, in, uses any fingerprinting. People background check, but no one else does fingerprinting. One district has decided to add it for volunteers who uh, regular responsibilities working one-on-one -on -one with a child or a teenager. Hmm. And any adult parent um, who might go on an overnight chaperone mm -hmm. um, experience field trip. Those two narrow categories, they felt it was, it was uh, important to the school to take to that next step. I wrote to John and asked him if he might check with the principals to see just how widespread one-on-one -on -one, uh, volunteer responsibilities are. And most of what he heard back from the high school was um, is primarily in some folks that have been recruited to work with our ELL students just to have a second language, you know, ability to speak in them, not in their second language, in their home language, just as a, as a nice way to be able to talk to someone. Um, we hadn't, I hadn't heard yet middle or elementary. I'm not sure if you have a good handle on that. But if that's a narrow definition and a one-on-one -on -one is a pretty unusual situation, that might be one thing we'd consider. The adult chaperones and overnight field trips might be something we want to consider. John is also looking at a, uh, an additional background check that this um, group adopted that, in, that includes a source called Inform Me, where no one's fingerprinted beyond that narrow band, but in addition to the regular background check, the name is run through Informy. It doesn't involve fingerprinting, but it does check for anyone who might show up uh, as a sexual offender on the national database, which I think could be a helpful add. John wasn't aware of that source. I just talked to him about it today. He's going to investigate it further and inform the policy committee if that wouldn't be a practice that would be wise to add to his vetting protocol. So. Um, we're looking for you from direction, Kim, and Heather and I will be meeting again in policy committee uh, in June, giving one last look to this draft um, and you know, um, bringing you language that I hope we can then vote on at our next meeting. But uh, we'd be interested in hearing any of your thoughts before we go into that final deliberation. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. I'm you're shocked about that. Mm -hmm. um, what is the scope of the geographic location in which typical fingerprinting would go through? Is that, would that go into the federal FBI database? Yes. And that's $55 a hit, is that Yeah, and that's, that, and that's a narrow look at, um, um, my understanding is it's a narrow look against uh, offenses against children. Not dissimilar to the sexual offender yeah. registry. Yeah. And then what would be the, so it seems like it would be the same data sets that they would be looking at, and I'm wondering if the Informe is maybe cheaper? Well, that's why I'd like more John to investigate that more yeah. and to even call the school that adopted that to learn more about that from them so that we can report that out to you more clearly next month. That's just some new information that's come our way. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I am interested in exploring those more deeply, mostly because, especially with that narrow look, to me, I think once your, your, your students are you know, middle school and high school and, and the settings in which they operate more and more out in the community, um, that, that tight scope of, of 
controlling who they talk to becomes less possible. Right. But for those who are English as a second language or who are more vulnerable students, mm -hmm. um, you know, figuring out ways in which we can protect them, uh, just like we can fingerprint teachers, right? right. Right. Who have regular contact one on with one, one potential. On one potential. I will say one of John's concerns um, originally was you can normally be assigned. I work in a third grade. I, I would work with uh, four little girls usually. What if three of them are sick and you've got one? Well, that's not my regular assignment. You know what I'm saying? So those things that spontaneously may happen for a few minutes or even a day. But if regularly I was asked to come in and tutor a child who was struggling in math week after week, one on one, does that, does that push us into doing a, a little bit of a deeper look? Perhaps the inform me will satisfy us enough. I'll, I'll know more about that by the time we look to vote on this in a month, but between that and fingerprinting, those are the sort of last topics we're really considering. I'd, I'd just like to say, Barbara, that um, I'm, I'm so appreciative that this is, continues to be um, explored and reviewed and, and in, input from everybody is still being considered. I, I see no reason not to um, explore this further and, and possibly consider in the, in the more um, narrow circumstances, especially with anybody who's a regular volunteer, to apply one or both of these, you know, however, whatever makes sense, okay. one of these options. Um, I know that members of the community, um, I haven't heard anybody from the community who has felt otherwise. Um, okay. And I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not sure what the downside is. Right, well, that's. Other than cost, I guess. But. And, and just wondering from a practical purpose, how many people we're actually talking about? What are the different roles? And hopefully, Kelly and Mike, you can get some information back to John for us so we can vet that fully at policy. But. Um, I had, there were, well, you all read most of the emails that I received, and there were several suggestions about looking at that narrow scope of just really adding that extra bit of protection for kids. This all came about, by the way, John asked for this review last year, and we put him off. So it was timely, and I think it just struck a chord with many parents. This is a time to really speak up and really try to see if we can't do this as safely as we can, while still appreciating this culture of enormous volunteer energy in our town, not dissuading that, but, but being as cautious as we should prudently be. So I think I'm hearing, you're hearing what I'm hearing. Kim, we'll go back to our next meeting. John, did you want to add anything? Is that? No, I, okay. I, I, I was just going to say that the, 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 the challenge is always balancing mm -hmm. the, the you know, essentially, it's like putting a, a toll booth on the highway, and you just want to like you don't want to have a backup, you don't want to impede the flow, you want to have a, a freedom and security trade-off. And there's always that, and it just I think it's being approached really thoughtfully. And the people who, um, uh, you know, there are people who it impinges on. They're not likely to write you a letter. Mm -hmm. um, they're just likely to not volunteer. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it, you know, there are real trade. There are trade-offs. Um, I'm, um, but you know. I'm happy with the process that we're pursuing. Thank you. I'll just add that I um, am supportive of the updated language, as well as that kind of thoughtful look at that narrow band of per in very specific volunteers, maybe those regular one-on-ones, and the overnight chaperones. That kind of, mm -hmm. and and in in talking about that balance, and you know how many that would affect. I, I suspect I, I don't have any reason to think otherwise, but I suspect that it would probably not be a hindrance when we're talking about a very narrow group of people. Yep. So interested to see where the inform me right. research goes. Right. Exactly. And, and what kind of access Compared that Compared to fingerprint, yeah. what's that very, difference? What does that give us yeah. beyond? Mm -hmm. I just don't know the answer well, tonight. Well, so I'd also like to I'd like to thank the policy committee for for digging in on this. And I'd like to thank the parents who are um, reaching out to us and, and making their voices heard. Um, I challenge people to take it to a higher level because frankly it's really not about volunteers. It's about all adults that are working with our students. Right. Yeah. And so um, this discussion really frankly belongs around all staff, all, it, it, it belongs around everybody and, and how we 
work with students and how we want to. We teach them to be safe right. in, in many contexts. Yep. I and agree. It's not just about the volunteers, it's about um, guidance policy or, I mean, uh, guidance curriculum and you know what teachers are doing and that sort of thing and, and talking to students right. about how to protect themselves or to disclose or you know right. whatever right speak up speak up yeah okay well we'll bring that back to you then in the june meeting thank you so no action required right thank you for your hard work on this you're welcome so moving on to item 6f I believe we have to read this whole one out, Catherine. And then will you explain to us? Someone who is not too tired and tongue-tied <laughs> needs to make this motion then. I've got it. All right, go for it. So I move that pursuant to 28 MRSA section 14862 and 2307, the form of notice of amounts adopted at town council meeting be approved and that the superintendent of schools be authorized and directed to complete said notice in accordance with the meeting at which the school budget is approved and to cause said notice as completed to be delivered to the town clerk for display at the polling places for the school budget validation referendum to be held following the meeting at which the town council approves the school budget. Do I have a second? A second. Could you tell us what that meant? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what that whole vote is, is to give <laughs> the superintendent the authority to, after the budget next Monday night, to sign off and date it, and then we can give it directly to the town clerk, That which I missed a step. What you will do tonight is sign it, saying after you vote it and you approve it, and she has the, the primary one. Um, you sign it tonight, but this vote is then giving the superintendent to a, uh, the authority that after the council votes on the budget, he will, there's a line for what the council votes, he will put in what the council votes and then um, sign it, uh, authorizing it at that point and then giving it to the town clerk so she can post it at the bowling, polling station. So that's what, it's, it's to help kind of make it a little bit more streamlined mm -hmm. with a lot of legalese. <laughs> And again, that polling place will be open on June 13th. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for that. And for the board, um, at the conclusion of our meeting, we want to make sure that we sign that. Yeah. So well, if we give vote. it to Ms. Danker to we'll happily take Thank you. responsibility for that. <laughs> as long as I don't have to read it. <laughs> so. For other discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. 6 0. Moving on to item 6G. I move that we can um, approve the following 2016-17 athletic personnel nominations. In the middle school, Will Russell for lacrosse, boys, seventh grade. Erin Agrandia for girls lacrosse in eighth grade. Jane Redberg for girls, uh, seventh grade lacrosse. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Six, thank you. Item six H. You may have a motion, please. I move that we accept the following C um, grant uh, for let's see the following C grant with the value of over ten thousand dollars pursuant to our policy, which uh, requires approval for grants over ten thousand dollars for the grant that will um, be given for the creation of a student-based television station for the Cape Elizabeth High School in the value of 14,837. Second. I'm wondering if Mr. Shedd could speak super briefly on um, what this is all about and if anybody's talked to Noel and things like that. Yeah, Noel, Noel, the technology folks have been involved from the beginning. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a product of teachers from various departments, um, technology integrators, Noel, Jason Lund, Wendy Derzewick, who's in charge of the cable TV, um, has been consulted with it and is very supportive of it. I will say, just as a note of lowering expectations a little bit, 
creating a TV, really what we're talking about is help, helping the kids develop the skills to, at first, feed material to probably a uh, YouTube channel for the high school. Um, also, that can be put on our website. That can also be fed um, through the existing um, cable TV that Cape Elizabeth has. Um, creating a TV station down the, down the next year is not, this is a long-term project and it's a long-term investment in technology that over several years as we get better at helping kids develop the skills and understand how to use the technology. And, and it's really to build on some passion that kids do have um, in this area who may not be super athletic or may not be super whatever you want to whatever you want to call it it's 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 to tap into that side of some other kids as well I'm, i was really super excited to hear about this the high school that i had attended had a weekly instead of a weekly newspaper we had a weekly news show and every friday afternoon at 1 30 the entire school whatever room you were in had well we had two televisions, it was a while ago, but we all watched live news shows that were written and produced and broadcast all by students. It was an incredible um, community building as well as skill building event for the, for the school. So the possibilities of this seem really exciting. It was exciting. very exciting. Yeah, I'm and I'm, I'm thrilled also. I think the possibilities are endless and I'm excited to see what turns out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for hanging in there with us. Um, I would also, and I'm sure you were about to, but I'm sure you will echo the sentiment that we greatly appreciate the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation support schools to be able to bring this innovative type of project that is lies outside of the scope of our budget. You said it. I was going to say it, but <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Jane. <laughs> We are deeply grateful to see for offering this opportunity to our students. And um, just because this has become such a significant uh, policy for us in gifting, I, I think it would behoove you to read all of the gifts that, even though they're below 10,000, are coming our way as a result of this spring. It was one of the things we offered that we, they need more public acknowledgement mm -hmm. of these various grants. So there's would a you full be list. To do a far sure. Business? I would have to. Um, of You're course. there, and I'm I not have there it right yet. here. So, for Pond Cove, building understanding and respect for cultural diversity through children's literature for $6,500. The Pong Project at the middle school, a ping pong table for the table tennis club during advisory period, $1,200. At the high school, a coding club, programming hardware, raspberry pies. Pie? I know mm -hmm. my raspberry pies, but this is <laughs> PI. And photons for $1,200. And the one we specifically will vote on to accept for the CETV station is a total amount of $14,837, or a total gift this spring to the Cape Schools of $23,737. So I certainly appreciate the effort. Significant. Absolutely. Thank you for that. All those in favor? Thank you, six. Moving on to item seven, committee reports. Uh, the town um, comprehensive committee is meeting tomorrow night. Um, and we have selected um, consultants to help um, build opinion surveys and uh, surveys of the, of the town, um, which has not begun. The, the, building of that, but we're, we're starting to make some headway. Thank you, and thank you for your participation on that committee. Thank you. We've heard from policy, but we're happy to. Well, I will just say that our agenda keeps getting bigger. <laughs> um, for our next meeting, we'll uh, revisit volunteer policy quickly, so it's ready to come to you in June. We will. Uh, uh, revisit the language that Kathy re reviewed with us, which was um, on IKE curriculum development, promotion re uh, retention acceleration, IG I'm sorry, IGA curriculum development, IKE promotion acceleration of students, and IKF graduation requirements. We did get through all of them the last time. She took some wonderful notes and is going to send us then the draft and hopefully ready for first reading 
uh, at our June meeting also. And new at, at that meeting <coughs> will be an introduction of the proposed wellness policy that the group has been working on hard for several months. Very hard. Yeah. And so I look forward to seeing that more closely. Thank you. Any other committee report? The only thing I have to say for finance is we have two more steps left our next Monday with the, is it Monday? Monday the 15th. At 7 o'clock, um, the, the people of Earth Town Council votes to send our budget to referendum. And then, of course, there is the citizen vote to adopt the school budget on Tuesday, June 13th. Thank you. Would you suggest that, um, that citizens either for or opposed perhaps come to speak to this issue with so the, the council? The workshop was last week. Will they I, accept any more public comment? I don't the know vote? their protocol for accepting public comment on the agenda items, but I do also know that it may be highly effective to send an email in support as well, or opposed, mm -hmm. to the town council. I know that for sure is, um, will get your message to the right hands. Okay. So I happen to know, I believe they will take public comment. At the, beginning, at the beginning of the meeting. Of Monday night. Of Monday night. Okay. But uh, again, emails and um, phone calls don't seem to happen as much anymore. But right. Communication in one way or another is always appreciated by all the right. representatives, ourselves included. And I'd say that we are also open to any suggestions about how to best explain what people would like to hear more. Before you arrived, there was a question about the CIP plan and whether or not there is a potential bond proposal, which Joanne explained briefly, because we don't get into it hugely in public comment, that that was news to us. So anything that needs clarification for um, explaining this budget so citizens can vote in an informed way would be useful. Yes. So I, I do think it's all worth reminding people as we're talking about the, the budget vote coming up <coughs> that we invite participation all throughout our, the building up of our school budget process and it's somewhat disappointing to not have the level of community participation during the process when we're making the key decisions and having the key discussions but then having many subsequent comments from the public so that's somewhat frustrating um, so i would encourage people who have comments on the budget to participate in the budget process that we engage in throughout the year, there are ma many opportunities to review and comment upon our process. And if you have views on it, we'd like to hear them. Thank you. Moving on to item eight, school board agenda requests. Are there any agenda requests at this time? I'd like to remind everybody that agenda requests can also be emailed to myself or the superintendent. And we try to set the agenda at least seven days and post it seven days before the meeting. Item nine, announcement of upcoming meetings. I'll just say again, the town comp meeting meets tomorrow night um, in the Jordan Conference Room at uh, 7 p.m. Policy will be meeting on Tuesday, June 6th, and we did back it up, correct me if I'm wrong, all to 5.30, because I think there's a 7 o'clock high school concert. So instead of 6.30, the committee felt they could gather at 5.30 for June. Thank you. Any other committee reports at this time? Um, announcements about committee meetings. I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Moving on to, <laughs> you're looking at me and I'm thinking, well okay. done, Kim. No. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what you asked me to do. <laughs> May I have a motion, please? I, I make a motion for Joy. A second. All those in favor? Thank you. Good night.